We're going to finish up today the um, Sermon on the Mount. You guys are aware that's what we've been doing all summer, right? Going to the Sermon on the Mount? Okay, so I'm going to finish it up. It's been a great series. I think you guys would have to agree with me that we've been really blessed going through this. I'm hoping that it's challenged us to live our lives as Jesus has commanded us to do and also made us realize that uh, although we're still dealing with these corrupt and perishing containers called our bodies, as mine gets older, I realize what that really means, our eternal lives began the day we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. The Sermon on the Mount is awesome. I love the fact that except for the first two verses and the last two verses, first and last two verses, every word in between is what color? Red. It's written in red, just to show us that that is Jesus. So remember, if it's written in red, it's what Jesus said. That the very words our Messiah spoke, and my prayer this week has just been that all of us listening today are just going to open our hearts and receive his Sermon on the Mount message. And not only that we receive it, but that we obediently apply this incredible wisdom to our lives, knowing that this path that Jesus directs us to is hard, but also knowing it leads us to the abundant life. So let's pray. Father, we just are blessed that we can come, that we have, or we're able to be open and gather together as believers and to be able to just sit here and hear your word. I pray, Lord, that um, as we do, we won't just hear these words, but we will put them into action. We'll be doers of the word. <clears throat> Bless our time together, Lord. May everything we do today bring glory to your name. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn with me to chapter 7. Verse 13, if you don't have a Bible, just put your hand up and someone will bring one right to where you're sitting. If you need a Bible, just hand up, okay? So, um, Steve, just right over here. So turn to verse 13. I'm going to start in verse 13 of chapter 7. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. I've always thought that this is a pretty straightforward verse. Jesus is saying, take the narrow way because when you get to the narrow gate, it opens and grants you access to eternity in heaven. How? Through what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus is saying, I am the gateway to God. But Jesus also warns not to take the broad way, which leads to the wide gate, because that gate will open and you'll have to go through it and it will lead you to an eternity in hell with no hope of ever leaving this eternal torment. Now, just in case there's someone listening right now, maybe somebody just clicked on online and they've, they're listening to anything Bible for the first time ever. I just want to go through this because they might be thinking, well, I don't want to go to hell. And they're wondering, what is it that Jesus Christ has done for us? How is he the gateway to God and eternal life in heaven? So listen carefully. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of a virgin who lived a perfect and sinless life, he is the spotless lamb who was slain. He was falsely accused, wrongfully arrested, given an illegal trial, beaten, then convicted on false testimony, and then sentenced to death by crucifixion and nailed to a cross. And while on the cross, Jesus, the Son of God, bore the righteous wrath of God the Father and paid the penalty in full for our sins and for the sin of humanity. And then he willingly gave up his life for ours. And after three days, just as he said he would, he rose from death to life, proving that his death and resurrection has forever conquered the grave for those who by faith believe in him. That is what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen? Amen. 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 He did it all. We just have to believe by faith. That's the gospel, the good news that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to Scripture. But why? Why would God, the creator of all things, go through all of that? Well, in John three sixteen verse 17, which I know you guys probably all know by heart, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Why? Because God is love and he desires that all be saved. The reality is that to God, all lives matter. 
Let me, let me ask you this question. How many people alive in the world right now have to go to hell when they die? None. None. Zero. Nobody has to. All they have to do is believe by faith in the one God sent to save them. Sadly, most will refuse and choose to try and find their own way to God. They'll choose the broad way with the broad gate that leads to destruction. And just so there's no misunderstanding for those who think there are other ways, listen to what Jesus says in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The narrow gate is Jesus. He is the only way into the kingdom of God. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mention the story. Debbie and I received a handwritten letter through the mail from a man, we're going to call him Craig, who addressed us as dear neighbor. Keep in mind that neither of us have ever met him. We don't know who he is. I do, however, know where he lives. Um, he gave that information to us. But in short, he was asking us this question. Are we living in the last days? Now, I believe that his question is genuine, and he's concerned about <clears throat> where the world's headed and for our eternal lives, because he also asked us the question, what will happen after the last days? And he closed his handwritten letter to, to us as follows. If you would like an answer to this question, please write back, my name is Craig. And at the bottom of the corner of the page, he wrote, refer to jw.org. Now, I've written them back, but I'm not expecting to get the correct answers. I'll share a little more in the coming verses. Church, I mentioned this letter that Craig sent because there are millions and perhaps billions of people like him that are on the broad path to destruction, all because they believe in another way to God. I don't have time to mention all the different man-made, Satan-inspired religions that are out there, ones that this fellow Craig has, is following. And you know what? These guys, a lot of these people, they're very sincere in the religion they follow with the hope that maybe someday they'll be good enough to enter into heaven. Or maybe someday they will be reincarnate, <clears throat> sorry, reincarnated into a better version of themselves. And isn't that sad that that's your hope, that you might come back a better something? Now, I said all this based on the first verse, and I believe it's a very valid application of this verse. But church, who is Jesus addressing on the Sermon on the Mount? He's talking to his disciples. And he's talking to his disciples and those of us who believe. Look at what he tells his disciples in verse 14. He says, Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. After you have given your life to Christ, Jesus says there is a narrow or a right way, and it's the difficult way to walk our walk. And if there's a difficult way, that also means there's a broad way, an easy way. And Jesus appealed to his listeners to choose to go the more difficult way which leads to life and life abundant. And I'm not talking about a salvation issue here. I'm just talking about paths that we can choose. Jesus is saying in this verse that to follow him, choose the narrow gate. It'll take us through persecution, hardships, and difficult decisions. Following Jesus requires crucifying our flesh, living by faith, enduring trials with Christ-like patience, and living a lifestyle separate from the world. The Christian life is a, is a difficult one because it comes with a new set of values, God's values. And as the last days are playing out, we're living in a world system that trumpets its own ideals, its own values, and slanders anyone who objects to or challenges those ideals or values. Maybe before you became a follower of Christ, you, you accepted a lot of what the world says as being truth without really thinking about it. But when Jesus changed you, your eyes were open to the truth, you began to believe in God's values, and you began to perceive the lies and the deceptions of this world. Church, fighting against those lies and deceptions can be difficult. Why? Because it's hard, and it's going to take commitment, and it's going to take dedication to God's word. It's applying God's word to our lives, and as you do, you're going to experience what? What does Jesus tell us? We're going to experience persecution. Church, in our day, persecution from the world, and sadly, even those who call themselves Christians, comes when you proclaim God's values and stand up for his truths. Truths like the definition of marriage as being between a man and a woman. It's not popular in our culture. So do you take a stand for it or, and be persecuted, or do you take the easy broad way and just remain silent? 
What about gender? Do you proclaim that God made them male and female or try to find some common ground? What's your position on abortion? The Bible never, ever says a woman has a right to choose. God's word says it's murder. He hates the shedding of innocent blood because he says babies' lives matter. Church, persecution comes when you defend God's values against a culture that has shunned God, like sharing God's views on homosexuality. <clears throat> There's a, a bill that was just passed in California. It's called Senate Bill 145. I'm not going to talk about it. If you want to Google it, you can, but it is probably one of the most disgusting bills I have ever come across so far. Uh, and I'm not going to mention what it is in this service. So, Pastor, you're saying that standing for God's values will bring some type of persecution from the world. How's that the abundant life? It sounds too hard. Well, let me explain something. In North America, we seem to have a different idea of the abundant life. And I'll give you an example, one little tiny example of my own experience that happens quite often in my workplace. For instance, a person crashes their new supercharged Range Rover autobiography, and now they're going to have to drive a rental, a new Hyundai Santa Fe for the new next six to ten weeks. And they literally have a tantrum because they can't be seen driving one of those. Church, that's called a first world problem. And even they call this a first world problem. But it's real to them. In North America and other first world countries, we tend to think of the abundant life as having material possessions. But the reality is that Jesus isn't concerned with you having the latest, most powerful SUV or a gorgeous sprawling home on acreage or the abundance of materially unnecessary possessions like boats, motorcycles, vacations, home overlooking, breathtaking views. Those are nice things and I, if you have them and want to lend them to me, I'll, I'll use them. But that's not the abundant life. It more often than not is the empty life. The abundant life is life eternal, a life that begins the moment we come to Christ and receive him as our Lord and Savior, and it continues on throughout all of eternity. The Bible makes it very clear, we're not of this world. We're currently sojourners living in this world, serving our Lord in obedience, proclaiming his truth, even in the face of persecution and rejection, while we await the eternal life that he has prepared for us. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the scripture means when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Church, can you imagine the incredible splendor of our internal home? Apparently not. We, we can't comprehend. We don't have the ability in this body, in this mind, to understand the incredible beauty of what he's created for us. And that's what we're to be living for. So if you want to live the abundant life, do as the Apostle Paul admonishes us to do. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Pastor D.A. Carson said, Jesus is not encouraging committed disciples to press on along the narrow way and be rewarded in the end. He is rather commanding his disciples to enter the way marked by persecution and rewarded in the end. It would seem then that many who consider themselves Christians in our day are choosing the broad way, the broad gate, because it's easier and there's lots of like-minded people walking it with them. But know this, the difficult life is the only life truly worth living. And if you choose the easy way, yes, you'll have plenty of company, but you're going to miss God's best for you. Now we're going to move into verse 15. Verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. In this verse, Jesus is warning his disciples about false prophets. They've been around a long time. And when Jesus taught this sermon, and in Matthew chapter 24, he warns us that false prophets will multiply in the last days before his return to the earth. And I think we're seeing that happen. These men come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And wolves tend to tear their prey to shreds. And so too, these false prophets come to destroy people's spiritual lives. 
So it's true that false prophets come in sheep's clothing, and they can be very convincing, and they're not always that easy to spot. They don't have little signs hanging off of them that say, watch out, I'm a false prophet. They're disguised, and they are very good at their disguise. They look and act like sheep, and they're very good at it. So how can we spot a false prophet? Jesus will tell us in verse 16. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. So Jesus now shows us what to look for if we suspect there is a wolf among us. Jesus says, we'll know them by their fruit. So what does that mean? It means that a tree or plants produce fruit according to their character. That's what he's liking these false prophets to. Has anyone ever picked a grape from a thorn bush or picked a fig from thistles? Of course not. Galatians 5.22 tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love. And that love reveals itself in joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So realize this, the false prophet will struggle with most of this fruit of the Spirit at some point, and his fruit will start to rot, stink, smell. You're going you're gonna to figure it out. So how can we guard ourselves against the false prophet? By observing several aspects of their lives. For instance, one, we should pay attention to the manner of living a teacher shows. Do they show righteousness, humility, and faithfulness in the way they live? Two, we should pay attention to the content of their teaching. Is it true fruit from God's word, or is it man-centered, appealing to ears that want to be tickled? And three, should we pay attention to the effect of their teaching? Are people growing in Jesus, or merely being entertained and eventually falling away? Church, it may take some time, but eventually the bad fruit becomes evident, revealing what sort of tree they are. And as an example, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So if anyone tells you there is another way, other than the narrow gate, he's a false prophet. Now, another danger with these false prophets, and another reason they're difficult to pick out, is because they do tell the truth a lot of the time. They won't go to your life group and start right out by denying the Trinity or saying Jesus is the brother of Lucifer. They're craftier than that. They need to convince you that they're real believers before they begin being real deceivers. So church, the basic fault in the character of the false prophet is self-interest. Typically, it's expressed by a desire for gain or an easy life, a desire for prestige, or the desire to advance their own ideas and not God's ideas. So, what's the best way to guard yourself against false teachers? Stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. Know God's Word. To have a proper and solid understanding of God's Word. In order to spot a counterfeit anything, you need to do what? You need to study the, the truth, the real thing. Any believer who correctly handles the Word of Truth and who makes a careful study of the Bible can identify these false doctrines. And I challenge you and I challenge me to be Bereans and to study the Bible and judge all teaching by what Scripture says. Amen. I say even test the pastors in this fellowship by what they say. I'm fine. I've, I'm good. <laughs> but those other guys, yeah, I, I check them out. No, they're, but we are called to do that. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the letter from Craig a Jehovah's Witness who wrote to Debbie and I asking if we knew what would happen after the last days. And I wrote him back and I thanked him for his concern for his neighbors and asking him in a single paragraph to tell me the reason for his hope after the last days. And I'm hoping he writes me back. I haven't heard, seen anything back lately, but I'm curious as to what he has to say and compare it to the truth of God's word. Now, and I want to... I want to continue this, if it's possible, to begin to share the gospel with him. Um, but we'll see what happens. But Craig has fallen for a lie. And a lie can be as simple as one intentionally and strategically placed letter between two words. For example, the JW's New World Translation that Craig believes in, that's what they've done. These false prophets have added one letter to the following Bible verse. And the Bible verse in the New King James says in John 1.1, 1, 1, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Does anybody know what the letter is that utterly destroys Craig's chances of eternal life with Christ if he continues to believe this lie? It's a letter A. And I'm not going to put it, I'm not going to read it as they have written it, because this message is online, they'll take a clip and I'll be a false teacher, so I'm not going to do that. But you can imagine when you place that letter A just before the last word of that verse, it totally changes the meaning. It goes from God, or from Jesus being God to Jesus being what they believe, a created being. The, Mike, the archangel Michael is what they actually believe. So adding that one letter means denying that Jesus is God and believing that lie results in eternal damnation. And that's why we need to know God's word. It's interesting because Jehovah's Witnesses can easily deceive the unsaved who know nothing of the true biblical scriptures, as well as many other cults. The cult convinces their followers to go door to door, two by two, writing letters to people like me, sharing a false gospel, which they truly and genuinely believe in and believe they are doing the work of God. And yet they will face the same eternity as all of the other types of false prophets in the world. What is that eventual eternity for them? Well, let's read the next three verses. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then listen to what he says. Jesus says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Church, I spent a lot of time pondering and praying about these verses because I know people who use that term Lord. They believe that they are believe, they believe they're believers, and they're clearly not. Um, but they have this idea that if they just use that word, and there's going to be millions, perhaps billions of people who will bow before King Jesus and hear this chilling statement from our Lord. So what can we learn from these verses? First, calling Jesus your Lord doesn't mean he is. As a believer, we're to call Jesus Lord because that's who he is. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Alpha and Omega and the first and the last. Amen? Amen. Jesus is warning his people who speak or say things to him or about him but don't really mean it. Their mind is elsewhere, but they believe there is value in using words and fulfilling some kind of religious duty with no heart, no soul, and without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Trapp had this to say. He said, this warning of Jesus applies to people who say, Lord, Lord, and yet their spiritual life has nothing to do with their daily life. They go to church, perhaps fulfill some daily religious duties, yet sin against God and man just as any other might. There are those that speak like angels, live like devils, that have Jacob's smooth tongue but Esau's rough hands. And you may know some of those people. Second, doing things in his name does not mean you're saved. The people Jesus speaks of here had impressive spiritual accomplishments. They've done more than I've done. And look at the things they did. They prophesied, cast out demons, and had done many wonders. And this makes for an impressive resume if you're looking for a job with a prosperity ministry. But their works meant nothing to Jesus. And it's interesting because Jesus didn't seem to doubt their claims of doing all these works. He didn't say, you liars, you, you didn't really prophesy or cast out demons or do wonders. He doesn't say that. So what does this mean? It means that not all miracles are divine. A miracle simply means that a supernatural power is at work, and sometimes the source of that power is satanic. And even though they claim to have done all these things in Jesus' name, they only said it to get the credit. These people practiced lawlessness, and Jesus made it painfully clear. They never had a true relationship, a relationship where Jesus is their Lord, and they are his servant. Sure, they called him Lord, Lord, but they weren't obedient to him. They weren't following his commandments. They were, in a sense, doing their own thing. They were using his name to preach to others, but they were preaching for their own glory, to fulfill their own needs. Clark had this to say. He said, speaking of Jesus... 
Through my love to the souls of men, I blessed your preaching, but yourselves I could never esteem, because you were destitute of the spirit of my gospel, unholy in your hearts and unrighteous in your conduct. And Spurgeon had this to say, if preaching could save a man, Judas would not have been damned. If prophesying could save a man, Balaam would not have been cast away. And third, when you accept Jesus as your Lord, it's going to bring about personal and moral transformation. It just does. But these people were still lost in their sin. Look at what Jesus says to them again. Just, can you imagine hearing these words? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Can you imagine spending your life doing what you thought was God's work and to find out that you were deceived? Jesus declares his rightful judge the evidence, and it's the absence of any moral standards is proof of not knowing him. Lawlessness means a lifestyle of continuous sin. Jesus gives us a very timely reminder for the church in our day. As many Christians seem to have taken the position that any mention of personal transformation or turning from sin is adding works to being saved by grace. This is a false teaching. Amir Sarfati said it well, newness of life, transformed and renewed minds, and no longer living as we used to, is not works-based righteousness. It's righteousness at work in us, changing us, transforming our thinking and giving us new desires. These things don't earn us our salvation. They are the result of our salvation. Amen? Amen. Now think this through. For all who profess to be Christians, meeting Jesus in eternity will result in one of two responses. For believers who have been faithful servants to the Lord who saved them and who love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and who love their neighbors as themselves, they will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. For so many others who heard the words but never allowed those words to reach their hearts, they will hear, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Church, these have to be the most horrific words a human person would ever hear, ever. Jesus Christ is a loving, yet just and holy God. He must punish sin, and his judgment is perfect, without error, irreversible, and final. But it was totally avoidable through his sacrifice for our sin. No one ever has to hear these words. They made the choice themselves, and it means a dreadful sentence of separation from God for all eternity in a very real place people don't like to talk about, and that's hell. Church, that's why we must continue to preach the gospel until he comes or until we take our last breath on this earth. Now, Jesus gives his disciples some more incredibly wonderful advice. In verse 24, it says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus says to his disciples, who hears these sayings of mine, he's referring back to the entire Sermon on the Mount. And church, I want you to wrap your head around this. Jesus is driving home the importance of obedience. It's not enough just to come to church and hear a nice sermon and be in total agreement with it and then just go about your life like you never heard it. The disciple who hears and then does what Jesus commands is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. His life is built on God's absolute truth, a truth that can never be shaken no matter what storms come into his life. Again, Trapp had this to say, time and storms of life will prove the strength of one's foundation. Even when it's hidden, we may be surprised when we see who has truly built upon the good foundation. At last, when Judas betrayed Christ in the night, Nicodemus faithfully professed him in the day. We can't always know for sure who's built their life on the solid rock, but a time will come when a person will find out. And as we navigate through these last days... We're hearing of prominent pastors and worship leaders who aren't just leaving ministry. They're walking away from what they thought was their faith. It's sad. They didn't build it on Jesus Christ. 
These are people who have heard Jesus' sayings but don't do them. They have not built their lives or their ministries on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. It's like that for every single one of us. If you're not built on the solid rock when the storms come, you're not going to be able to stand. There's nothing for his life to stand on if it's not built on the rock. Bruce had this to say, Wherein lay the second builder's folly? Not in deliberately seeking a bad foundation, but in taking no thought of foundation. His fault was not an error in judgment, but inconsiderateness. It is not, as is commonly supposed, a question of two foundations, but looking to and neglecting to look to the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Church, choose the narrow gate. Live the life of the narrow way. Know God's word so you can recognize false prophets. Remember that God seeks relationship with him as your Lord and you as his servant. And that if you build your life with him as your foundation, you're going to be able to withstand any storm. In closing, I just want to read the final two verses of the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 28, it says, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. It's interesting because the English word astonish, which is derived from the Latin word, I don't know how to say it, extonere, means to strike with thunder. That's how this hit them. That's how this teaching affected them. They didn't have the Bible as we know it. They were listening to the scribes and the teachers of their day who typically would just say, thus says the Lord, or uh, Rabbi Gamaliel says this, and they, they never really had authority. They just had people talking about the way things should be. But then here comes Jesus, who says things like, in verse 21 of Matthew 5, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in the danger of judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. He had final authority. He is the final authority. They were hearing things like, you heard it said, um, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus spoke as one who had the final authority because he is the final authority. And they had never heard teaching like this. Church, what about you? Have you been astonished each Sunday as we went through the Sermon on the Mount this summer? If you haven't been astonished, then I just suggest that you go through it again. This morning, I actually um, did a... Um, I had... I don't know what you do. You go and, I got somebody to say it online. They read through... Reading through the Bible. And I did Matthew 5 through 7 as I was getting breakfast ready. And just listening to it, it was... Incredible. So I'm just encouraging you guys to go through the sermon once again to realize just how incredible all of what Jesus said is about applying to our lives. Let it sink in and live the abundant life that Jesus Christ has called you to. Let's pray. Father, I'm just so thankful that we have your word. I'm thankful that we can gather as family and just go through this. Lord, I, in the world that we're living in, we're hearing so many crazy thoughts and ideas. And uh, Lord, we can go right back to your word and know what the truth is. And we don't have to even question it. Lord, give us the strength to be those that are willing to walk the narrow way, to not be fearful of persecution, but to bring glory and honor to God and his word uh, to do it lovingly, and just to know that a lot of times it's going to get rejected. But they're rejecting you. They're not rejecting us. So, Father, I just pray that you'll give us courage to live out our days, however many or more days, years we have left, um, serving you. So we just ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody here said, Amen. Amen.